cloud. And then, um, let's see, uh, where audio options? Uh, no. Oh, I think it's under participants. That's what it is. Well, that, this tool is is great, but it's so great that it's it's confusing. So bear with me for a second here. Manage participants. Here we go. Ah, here we go. Unmute all. Oh, that wasn't what I should have done, is it? All right. Back uh, unless you. people wanted to be unmuted. There we go. All right. Now I've said it where where everyone is muted, but you can unmute yourself. Um, at least that's the belief. So if you have a question, want to comment, say something we forgot, hit us with it. Okay, we were perfect and nobody has any questions. <laughs> Anybody wanna say anything in the chat? They're stunned in silence. Oh, I see Jackie trying to mute it. Oh, nice! Hey, I, you, I was you were, muted. You, well, because I, I um, I had to mute everybody and then unmute and make it optional. So sorry about that. <laughs> it's no problem. Uh, the thing was, I didn't see the mute in mine, so I actually thought you could hear me, and I also thought that you were ignoring me. So. Um, <laughs> No, 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 no. So I saw some chatting and stuff, and, and I'd say. Okay, my chat window disappeared. I got to find it, but um, was there anything in particular? No, I think uh, there was some asking for specific examples. Not anyone I think I can just do here now. I would probably need some time to read up on it. Okay. Uh, sorry, I've only just joined about 10 minutes ago. Did you say this was recorded? It was, yeah. And yeah, someone yeah. is already answering it. So yeah, we can't even keep up with the chat. <laughs> yeah, so it, it was recorded. We'll, like last time, we'll get, so as we, oh, I finally found my chat window. As we um get used to having these first off obviously it will work better at making sure we get the right time set when we send out the stuff um, but then also the um, getting the after recording you know getting that out earlier with the resources and things and just so if you guys have questions um, you know we're, we, we both work full-time and we're doing this for fun so bear with us but we'll um, make it available as um, soon as possible and try to get better at doing it faster yeah, yeah, we, again, each time we get closer to the format that we want. So, and that would be the same with the after match after this. I think that we are pretty clear on what we're going to do, right, Joe? Yeah, yeah, actually, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm reading this right now, but, um, it, it, and I see um, Mason Jarrett said something about he'd love to see that the next webinar. I'm trying to find what he was asking, but my point being, when you got if you guys have topics you want covered something to learn right ping us let us know um and then we what we'll do is just basically say look if it's uh if it's really we think it's really niche maybe we'll do a one-on-one -on -one and talk it through but if it's if it's something that will have a broad appeal then we'll um we'll have it as some sort of a feature or something yeah again we we're very happy to um have uh, guest speakers or whatever you're gonna call them. Uh, so if you have something that you think you can contribute, you're very welcome to contact any one of us and uh, let us know. And we'll we'll also be happy to co something with you, whatever it might be. If you just wanna maybe bounce something off of us, we are also ready for that. I'm getting a lot of sounds. It's is that on your end, Joe, or is it's just the system that's saying it? I I don't. I'm not getting a lot of sounds. Yeah, might just be my setup then. 
Um, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I see Moz when uh, will the link be posted? It'll will we will email um, after we, what we'll do is we'll put it on our site and then we will um, send out links via the email that if you're subscribed to this the the webinars you'll get it that way, or you can go to either of our sites um, and get it there. And at some point we'll probably put it on the the um, forum. Um, yeah, I created the off-topic one. Do you remember that one, Joe? Mm -hmm. um, I'll I'll put it in that one as well. I'll edit it and put in the links for the pages on our sites. So so it's easily accessible. If you're used to just going to the forums, you'll be able to find it there as well. Mm -hmm. um, we won't put every all of the content there, but we'll at least put links there so people can find it if they want to. So yeah, it's interesting. A lot more people actually unmuted themselves the last time. Yeah, yeah, we were we were kind of <laughs> expecting you guys to talk, um, which we're you know we're fine either way. I mean, I'm just teasing. Yeah, people can can do how they feel, but but yeah, if they don't have the needed setup anyway, they right. Yeah. Yeah, the, the nice thing, which which is I think most people here. I'm sure you guys mostly are on the forum. Um, the the attitude and, and understanding we're all in different learning places. We've all been there with just you're using your first hot key or hot string, and a lot of people, Jackie and other people, are way above me as far as programming wise. And you know, just you, you understand we don't don't feel embarrassed. Don't worry if you're you know before, and if you're above, please feel that you can. Uh, you know, lead something. Even if you don't lead it talking wise, if you want to write something of an outline tutorial, then we can talk to it. That would be awesome too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, is there a Dell call for recording audio from mic? <laughs> That's a good question. There probably is because you can record audio from mic. There is probably a Dell call to do it. But there is, but there's also some great. Um, um, there's stuff for the what's it, the Windows Media Player as well as some other stuff that you can you could also tap into, right? So there's a lot of different ways you could go about recording it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There, there is, and you can also call uh, download third-party Dells to do it, and command line programs that will allow you to do it. And there's a lot of ways to record sound from a mic. You don't even need to use the code to do it. So Jackie and I were talking earlier of um, one of the ones we're planning upcoming is doing one on COM, so Windows Component Object Module. And even though, you know, we're going to first start off talking about um, like Microsoft Office programs like Word and Excel, but um, there, there are a lot of the, once you get used to looking at that, for me, I can read the Combe stuff and adapt it so much easier than I can a DLL call. So when I find like a Windows program, they're not always just Windows, but often they are. A Windows program that does what I want, I'll see if I can access that with a COM object because it's really easy for me to use AutoHotKey to connect to it and to drive that thing to go do what I want. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. I I myself I, I don't know I pretty quickly got into trying to use com because the first ever project I had was moving values from one Excel window to another and if if I wasn't supposed to fall over all of the examples of actually manipulating IE with com I don't really know um, it seemed at one point like it was the only stuff I could find at all when doing a search for anything with IE. So I, I needed to step into that steep learning curve and start using it pretty quickly. But um, it is it is very powerful. But I've also heard at one point that it is um, not something that Microsoft is focusing on anymore. Mm. It is, of course, sad, but for now, we have a lot of functionality there. But I think, did you say the, com the component object module, was that what you said? Yeah. I think it's the model, right? Model. I always say module. You're right. It's model. It, it, yeah. Yeah. I think, and, and you must not 
really put too much into that. But I th remember reading that Calm is actually a model of how you structure stuff in memory um, so that it's easier for other programs to know where to look and therein comes the model. Interesting. So it's, it's a model of a way to to structure your your stuff in memory. So so, so for those of you still on here, like I when I first started, especially do because I started off with web scraping instead of doing stuff with Office, which I wish I had reversed that because web scraping is so much more complicated. But um, I saw the stuff on Com, and so I bought like I'd say like six different books on Com. And none of them were remotely helpful for like using it with auto hotkey. I mean, it was so in the weeds for me. Um, but but um, yeah, it was. It's it's probably because it was going at the core of it instead of how to you know basically use it. Yeah, I know that there is a function by I think it's it's a tutorial somewhere on the old forum by Isnall. I think it is where he talks about using. Um, uh, Dell with f Dell calls to do calm at a deeper level than oh. that I've ever done, mm -hmm. and his understanding of it, of the concept of it, is just so profound compared to to what I'm. Um, <laughs> the level that I'm at is nowhere near that. But it, it must come from a uh, much better understanding of programming as a whole. That's that's my take on it. Is there anything else anyone wants to chat about, cover? People are still chatting, I see yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but we are we're the only ones talking, but <laughs> if, uh, that's that's no problem if people don't want to talk there. Yeah. Amen, Ronans. You had you had something. He was just saying that um, auto hockey makes using calm so much easier. It's it feels like it. Uh, I see some VBS mentioned somewhere as well, and and yeah, the the VBS parts, the things you will see in the macro creator and stuff in Excel and Word and whatnot. Um, it, it, the implementation that AutoHotKey have chosen looks so similar to that, yeah. and and the interesting part is that it looks very similar to um, the code used with JavaScript on on web pages and stuff. This dot syntax that we're using for objects generally, it just makes it so easy to find similar stuff from other languages yeah. that you can use. And that makes it uh, a good bit easier to actually get something off the ground. Yeah, and that, that was, um, for, for those of you who haven't done this much, but um, if you're trying to do something like, let's say in Excel or Word, uh, you can start recording a macro in either of those and then go look at the, the Visual Basic um, syntax, right, and then go borrow from that heavily and put it into auto hotkey and basically make some minor tweaks and usually get it figured out. The other thing I do a lot is I'll search if I can't find my answer on the auto hotkey forum, I'll search especially stack overflow of how to do X, you know, like in Excel with Microsoft Office using VBA um, or VBS and then someone else has solved it and then I just borrow from that and tweak it and put it into auto hotkey. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that that using this uh, macro recorder in Excel or whatnot uh, actually makes a lot of sense. And I, just while you were talking, I, I remember that when I started using on Hotkey, the download came with the, um, the macro recorder, this very simple script recorder that, that would only, it would record Windows titles and it would put a static sleep between everything you did. Um, and that was about it. It had no deeper functionality or anything. But as I remember it, it actually helped me the first couple of days getting some stuff off the ground. 
Um, so, and I've seen discussion about why it was removed and why it should be there and why it shouldn't be there and stuff. But I actually see the idea of having something that will give you the functionality here and now. And then over time, you simply just extend the sleep or you put in another key. And and I think that could still be helpful. Yeah, I, I in, in so... By the way, I started using Auto Hotkey when we were still on the old version, and Com wasn't really integrated. And so the I would try to use Com with the old version, and holy cow, that was like it was so much more confusing. So the new version makes it so much better. But um, I would try to use that macro recorder you're talking about, and it was amazing to me at how much extra stuff that it would put in there. But to your point, right? If I've never done it to say go go click on this window title and then go do this right it could give you the core of what you need and then you just kind of study it and get rid of some of the other junk right that's yeah. you don't need um so i agree it it, it does when you're new it, it can be very helpful yeah anybody in the um, in here who has used um Polo's macro creator creator I, I haven't that's why i'm asking i've used it before it's just you've used it before yeah i, I was just because I haven't used it, I was just thinking about, um, is it very involved or does it seem quite simple at the beginning or, or does it present a lot of options straight off the bat or what? For me, it's been so long since I used it. I don't recall. I don't remember it being anything really tricky. Okay, um, I, uh, it's, it was similar. Um, it seemed to do a bit more than the original one that you were talking about. Yeah, it, it uh, how how I interpreted it, it, it could do a lot more, mm -hmm. but I was just unsure of how simple the interface was. If you just wanted to do mm -hmm. normal straight up macro recording and nothing fancy, but yeah, I know he has used a lot of time on it. I can see that Nikki has raised his hand. Well, he can. Uh, did he have a question? I don't know. His hand is raised. It's, it says on my end or your end. I don't know. Lower hand. Wait, can I? But he can unmute himself, can he? Mm, I don't know. I was just there at the bottom. Of I screen. cannot unmute my. I'm sorry. Hold on. Oh, I'm, I'm. I'm working on it. Unmute audio. Hey, hello. Oh, can you hear it, me? It, it's yeah. a. It's a low, but yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I can change the volume. It's okay. Uh, audio options. Well, there's uh, no not much it's options not, in Zoom. It's but, not uh, that low. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, anyway, first of all, yeah, thanks for the uh, for the interesting uh, uh, webinar. Uh, some interesting stuff. Uh, I also wanted to add that I really like AutoHotkey's uh, help file. I I started AutoHotkey. Uh, it was kind of my first programming uh, language. And I started completely from scratch, and I used the help file for most of the things. Like I almost never used the forums or anything else. I mostly got by by only using the help file and the examples in them. Yeah. So it's like it's. I think it's a, one of the most comprehensive help files of any language. Like also Java's API or uh, C Sharp's API is yeah sometimes just lacking with with examples and. And auto hotkeys help us really great for that. I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would agree because I don't know. I kind of see uh, people putting the help file down sometimes, but I, I don't truly believe that it is bad because to me it has worked out great, and at, for the most part, I hear people saying the same thing. That yeah, I, I, I was think... really surprised. I, I think to Nikki's point, it's really easy when you're using it for a while and you forget what other ones are like to get down on it, right? But man, when you look at other ones, you're like, holy cow, it's it's pretty darn good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why. It's like they really spent a lot of time on it and it shows, like it really helps. Yeah, so yeah, it does. does. Yeah, so, yeah I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> glad to hear it. That's for sure. 
we we haven't really had anything to do with the help file but we have both had immense use of it as well yeah i mean i think you guys saw i have a bookmark on my homepage to it right at least to the, the online <laughs> I, I use it a lot oh yeah i just used the one that came with auto hockey but i had a shortcut on my desktop for it though mm -hmm. most of the time <laughs> But yeah, but sad thing is now I I can't I don't use auto hotkey that much anymore. Not as much as I want to, but just because I'm uh, for work and everything, I just use uh, C sharp and oh uh, wow languages related to that. So so okay. I'm curious because I run into this a lot where I'll talk to programmers who they say, oh I've I've used auto hotkey before and they stop using it. Um, mm -hmm. Do you so you don't you don't even keep like using hot strings to help you type code? Um. That's actually an interesting one. Uh, I could do that actually. I haven't, uh, like I said before, I I really like the idea of hot strings, but in practice, I don't really seem to use yeah. them. Uh, indeed, they could be very handy for code snippets and and stuff right. that I that you write uh, very frequently. Let so me um, let me share my desktop also. Now this is obviously I think this is a bit much, but um. In in let me get rid of this. So I I do I do a lot of SQL, and so I do mm -hmm. so much SQL that I even built, like my um you know common queries that I do in SQL, right? Mm -hmm. So I can have them you know at the tip of my fingers of what I'm trying to do. Uh -huh. It was like holy cow! I mean, granted, it took me a little while to set this up, but now the maintenance it makes it really easy to just do what I want. Um, and then I have other ones like let's say. Well, I miss, but, but I have some that I can just hit a key and, and put them in. So, so for like an in list query, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I have other ones that'll truncate it. Some that'll wrap it with percent signs so I can do matching patterns. But mm -hmm. just that's what I'm like. Even if I didn't use auto hockey in so many other ways, like for web scraping and stuff, because I do a lot of programming in SPSS, which is for statistics, and then mm -hmm. SQL, that like I'd still be using it for the just that aspect. So yeah. I. Curious. Oh, that's true. Maybe that's a good, uh, good way to get into auto hotkey again. <laughs> yeah, I that was for years. I thought I told Jackie, I'm like for years I was using hot strings where I can come in here and type. Um, oh, no, there we go. So this pulls up my macro, right? That I can then just put in the name of a variable, right? And this is how I can call it. But it puts in all the parameters for me. Um, for years, I was using hot strings to call up my macros to help me write my programs where I could literally, I mean, blow by anybody because I was so fast. I didn't have to go find where I had written something before, right, and go remember how I wrote it. I could just pull this up. And I thought I was like, you know, Joe and the special sauce. I mean, I was flying. And then I started learning object-oriented programming, and I was realized just how ass backwards so much of what I did was, right? <laughs> but... um it's still, I still to this day use, I mean, I, I'm Jackie laughs. Like if we look at my, this is my main um, auto hotkey file with, with how many hot strings, right. I have built into it um, and doing other stuff. And this is just one of my files that I have, you know, <laughs> running all the time. Um, yeah. So I do That's a lot. Of, yeah. I'd say that uh, I'd love to have both the, the clearness to what I need to remember making a hot string for it each time like you do, Joe, but mm -hmm. um, I've never had a hot string file or a hot key file uh, with that many definitions as you do. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't go out and keep doing the same script over and over again because yep. I save them and give them a good name and all that. But I don't really have a consistent file that starts up with Windows that that has something without a hotkey in it. Um, I don't know why, but I just don't. I, I even have some like so here. This is my reminder when I'm going to loop over, you know, over a, a, f a file and looping each line at a time. And here's how I parse that loop, right? And I, I have the, the things I frequently use. So even my write, writing my auto hotkey code, I have hot strings that, 
just because also I, you know what, and it's probably because I do this, but I can't remember all the stuff, but it's probably because I don't take up the time to do that, right? I just know that I've saved it somewhere and I can pull it up at the tip of my fingers, which I just love. Yeah, but I think the only downside if you have like a lot of hot strings, I think it's going to be Absolutely. hard to remember. Like, Absolutely. Okay, which hot string yep. did the thing so, I want right now again? Right. And that's why if you look like a lot of mine, I'll, I have patterns, right? Especially like if we get into email addresses or the, I was trying to think of my HTML stuff um, because I couldn't keep them straight. And so I started developing patterns to them, which really helped. Uh, but even then, to your point, I had some that I had so many. And that was when I said, you know what, I'm just going to build GUIs that will call up and do, you know, will put them in for me. Yeah, that's uh, very handy. I could, yeah. But those, you know, for me especially, those take time to build. Um, mm. so. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. But I think it would be handier uh, to if you have a really a big list of stuff. Yeah. Probably be handier than having to remember what what was what. Yeah. Or remember where you saved that certain thing you did. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or it depends, of course, how many times. Like I, a lot of these, I use you know a dozen times a day. Yeah, so it's, it's you won't just, forget those. That's right, yeah. But but even then, it's like I want them at the tips of my fingers where I don't want to go find a file and do whatever. Hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that sometimes it can be something simple that comes up during my day. I need to put in um, a simple value a couple of times or convert something and put it in on different screens on a web page or whatnot and to just simply be able to type something in with within minutes i'm not sure because i i'm not delusional so i'm not saying that auto hotkey is quicker than everything but to me it feels quite fast for me to develop something that i can use just for this one thing mm. and i believe that i can even develop something useful uh, in the amount of time that it would have taken me to do it manually and then because I save it I have it for a situation where I need to do it again at some point so I might not always be developing a program that does it quicker than I would have done it manually sure mm. but I feel that the task became much funnier or um, I was happier, happier yeah. doing it right because I was solving a programming puzzle instead of doing something fairly mind-numbing. Um, but if I ever get that task again, I would have already done the legwork, and then I would be able to blow through it. Yeah. And and I have had that happen quite a lot of times. So. You know, I would definitely agree that um, it was surprising to me how often it would come up after that like like you said jackie you have a task you're like well i could do this in let's say an hour or i could write a script which might even take me longer it might take me an hour and 20 minutes to actually write it but just because i'm like look it's a mundane boring thing i'm gonna write a script right and yeah hopes i might reuse it later but then how often my solution in some way or form the learning of what i did i get to apply in some other way and borrow from um, it was like I, now my go-to almost always is, uh, you know what, I'm going to write a script. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I've been quite lucky with that, I must say. I've, I've kind of, then I was kind of um, getting the task of someone else who was, let's say, vacationing or whatnot. And while they were away, I kind of thought, hey, this is really, really boring. Let me do something funny here and automate parts of it. So just to kind of entertain myself while doing it. And then all of a sudden the person comes back and I'm like, hey, I actually made this and I shared that with them. I was kind of, oh, really? And I've, I've actually got both a promotion and a raise from, from doing that often. <laughs> what, what I'm really yeah. laughing at, Jackie, is, is it's so funny to me that that is their full-time job, right? They've probably done for years. And you're going to do it for like a week. And you're like, oh, I'm so bored with this. I got to automate it. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, 
you know, and, and then it just changes their, their life or like you said, you're, you know, you get a, a, you know, hopefully your company instead of like I've run into where they're like, why would you do that? Oh, that's don't do your time on that. Oh my God. Oh yeah. I got that as well. I, I have, I've had that situation as well. So where, where they're kind of, because they, they truly don't understand that they, they think that you're doing something else, but the work. So they think that you are using your time on something that doesn't benefit them. Mm. And and to me, automating the task that I'm doing, I'm not gonna automate it so they can fire me. That's that's not the idea. The idea is to automate it enough to not really make it mundane for me. Hey, Joe had his hand raised. I just noticed I, I unmuted him. I swear I set this to where people can unmute themselves. But anyway, Joe, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, let's talk about other languages as uh, reminding me of a question that has been floating in the back of my mind for a long time. If you're a software developer developing what you hope to be commercial applications, do you think AutoHotKey is a good language for that? Or should you use what I've heard other people refer to as a real language like uh, the one Nikki mentioned, C Sharp, or uh, any or maybe even VB for that matter, any .NET language or uh, C++, of course, or anything in, in more in the realm where you can actually do a real compiler as opposed to the conversion that the uh, so-called auto hotkey compiler does and other issues surrounding the fact that it's a purely interpretive language. So I guess the bottom line question is, can you do commercial, w would you recommend commercial software development be done with a lot of hotkey. I'd like to say something at least. I I can't say for sure what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I I'd say I have done commercial stuff. Um, I've had no issues, and I know of no one actually taking the time to crack it or convert it or steal it or whatnot. I kind of feel like I'm saying a whatnot a lot, but hey. <laughs> Um, but I can't say if you should or shouldn't do because because it's an open source uh, language and as you said yourself the the compiling isn't really a compilation it's it's just packing the other hotkey uh, binaries with together with the script and and packaging those into a, a single file um, so so there's no real security there and and one of the surefire ways to always be able to get out the source is i can't remember what they call it but i think it was the payload method which allows you to get it out on almost any situation i think that hotkey it has made something new with the um, the hotkey dell that that might be making it um, less likely to be um, cracked or what you want, want to call that. Hey, Jackie, uh, just interrupting a second there. I'm not actually all that concerned about people stealing it, you know, cracking it, reverse engineering it. Um, and yeah, there is, you can do code obfuscation to some extent if you want. And, and I realize there's ultimately no real protection because it's an interpretive language. But I'm just more concerned I about the overall infrastructure of auto hotkey and more along the lines of professional development in terms of having libraries and uh, reusable code and so on is, is uh, to that extent is auto hotkey uh, okay to use as compared with say a, a C++ or a .NET language. The um, the source of auto hotkey is C plus plus, if I remember correctly, and and it, of course, as you said yourself, it's it's interpreted, but it is a stable language, it doesn't have much uh, many issues anymore. So, so you won't be making programs that are failing on you at least. Um, and I've heard some people talking about it being a little hard to. Um, co collaborate on making large or hotkey um, projects. But other than that, I, I don't see why 
how the hotkey would have a problem there. So um, let me add in. So so first off, in which you were you know kind of alluding to anyway on the security thing is no matter what you program in, right? There's always some security risk, right? Um, yeah, but but he wasn't really concerned I with security. I'm just, I know. Yeah. I'm just saying, it, no matter what you do, it does that. It's kind of a moot point to me, in the long run. Um, the availability of other existing libraries, right? Like that was one of the things I liked about Python when I started learning Python, but at the same time it was also there were so many libraries and not a lot built into it um it's 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 good it's just also it's um you know it's a big step to start learning how to use all of them um, and evaluating them the the one thing i would say is you know it gets into the speed of auto hotkey and that one gets into like hey what you're planning to do is it going to need millions of calculations right over and over um if that's yeah. the case probably Auto hockey is not the right thing, but mm. I always take into account the um, speed it takes to build the program in the first place as well, right? Which, for me, it's it's really fast in auto hotkey compared to in other languages. Auto hotkey is it has been benchmarked a couple of times, and it's 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 up there. Yeah, it's but I'm just saying, if he's doing a big data science thing, it, it's probably not the right tool for the job. Right. I mean, yeah, I, most people would say if you read the forums enough, uh, use the right tool for the job. And and I'm not saying that auto hotkey is always the right tool for the job. I'm I'm kind of with you on that, Joe. That it, if it is truly faster to develop stuff in auto hotkey, and, and I sometimes feel that it is, uh, small enough projects, yeah, keep it in auto hotkey. But if you are doing something really large, or if you want to have commercial applications for your stuff, and you want to go, let's say, mobile, or you want to go cross-platform or whatnot, our hotkey is truly not the thing because it's yeah. only Windows, and and that's that. It, it won't change. Not. Uh, Having said that, um, just so you know, I don't know how much this happens for you, but um, I, I've used it on you know Windows 8, Windows 10, Windows 7, across uh, a lot of different computers at work and at home, and I give it to my colleagues at work. And generally speaking, it's pretty stable in the different environments, and you don't run into too many random issues. It's more likely the, the user access control where I have my little hiccups on things. What language, when you guys want don't use auto hotkey and you want to do something um, you know, as I think you used, used the word of computer science earlier so was, in any event what what language is your language of choice for when it's not auto hotkey so so actually that um, let me tell you about four years ago I, I got tired of hearing from from other people and my boss and, and stuff that like nobody uses auto hotkey and so i wanted to get some credibility as having a clue as what i'm doing so i started learning python right and everything i would do in auto hockey i would say all right let me do this in python and after time after time like i could do it all, all not everything but close to everything in python and of course python does other things better than auto hotkey but um that was the main reason why i started using python it wasn't that i had things i couldn't do in auto hotkey it was that I wanted people to feel like, also that they'd feel better at work that, hey, other people, they can hire someone who knows Python. That's easy to find as opposed to someone who knows AutoHotKey, which is fewer. But really, AutoHotKey is a simple language, right? You can pick it up pretty easily. Um, so Python is the one I learned for a while, but then I stopped really learning it because I realized, you know what? I can do everything faster and easier in AutoHotKey than I can in Python. And so I stopped using it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, I I say I'm I'm no uh, programmer by trade. I I do a lot without a hotkey. I've also dabbled in Python and C plus plus, and I've also done a lot with the website of stuff, HTML, CSS, and and those JavaScript and whatnot. But I haven't done enough, and I've not run into any kind of walls with out of hotkey compared to my usual work where I use it most. So so I, I wouldn't be able to guide you what you should do and what you shouldn't do because for the most part, 
I can do it in auto hotkey and, and I'm happy with that. Okay, fair enough. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Anybody else have anything? No, not really. Great questions, Joe. Yeah. That's yeah. Good stuff. Is was there anything else now that we have time? Um, is there any other questions on the DLL stuff that would help to finish up on? I know we kind of jumped out of it, but it, it really is kind of a as your need arises, you go to look at something and then you have to dive deep into it. Yeah, uh, as long as you've asked for questions, um, I tend to do a lot of calls of uh, command line executables, EXEs, as opposed to DLLs. And I've written a, just a ton of, uh, of auto hotkey code that calls things like the XPDF utilities, which are a series of nine great EXEs uh, that, to manipulate PDFs. I, I do a lot with in the document imaging business. That's been my field for a long time. So do do things with PDF files and TIFF files. And I found that AutoHotKey is really terrific at being able to call a command line executable. PDFTK is another great example. There's a product called, they've got a GUI, but the one I really like is they've got a product called PDFTK server. Um, and at first you might think it has to run on a server OS, but it doesn't. It just I don't know why they call it that. It runs on any Windows. And so all you have to, it's just an EXE with a supporting uh, DLL. Um, LibbyCon V2 is a DLL that supports it. With, and all you have to do is have those two files, the EXE and the DLL. Now, you don't call the DLL directly. You call the uh, PDFTK EXE. And you can do that from you know, using run wait in auto hotkey. And it, it works really well. Um, what I'm unclear on, I, it, so I've just written a boatload of programs I call a whole lot of EXEs, but I've never called a DLL from AutoHotKey. So I found that whole segment today very interesting. Thanks, you guys, for that. Um, but what strikes me is I'm wondering if I find a DLL somewhere that looks interesting that I want to call from AutoHotKey, um, with the EXEs, it's usually very easy to figure out what the calling sequence is, but not so much with DLLs. And, and when you guys find a DLL that looks interesting, how do you figure out what the calling sequence is for, um, from a, from auto hotkey? Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the harder ones because for some, you would have some documentation made by the people who actually made the DLL. Um, for others, you would have a header file that would have the definition. So you would be able to go and, and look in the Dell and actually see what's in there. So you could see what parameters it needed and stuff like that. But it, it depends on what you are able to read. If, if you can't read the code that the Dell is written in, it's hard to actually interpret it into anything. And actually, well, one thing you said that really interested me, I, I had no idea that DLLs could be source code. I, I thought DLLs were always compiled object code. Um, no, not necessarily, no. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to find it. I had an also a DLL viewer that would, you know, depending on what you're looking at, would, would show you some of the information in it. It, it. it at least gave you an idea of the functions that were available. Um, it, it wasn't awesome. Oh, here we go. Let me see if I can launch it. Oh, come on. Anyway, oh, there it goes. Okay. So then you point it to a DLL and, and, um, and it can show you, so this is the SPSS the statistical program I use, show you, it doesn't tell you, help you tell you really a lot of how to actually use it, but it, it, sometimes you can get a good idea of what's available in it. If you don't have a different way to do that. <laughs> so this DLL um, export, export viewer. Let's see if I can go about. Um, Nursoft, I guess is how you'd say that. I don't know. Yeah, it's a guy named, his stuff is fantastic. I've been using nope. it for years. His, his name yeah. is Near Sofer. And uh, all this stuff is, he has his whole series of free utilities and they're just fantastic. Okay. I, I, I call a lot of them from 
from Morohaki. Yeah, he has some great stuff. I've I've seen the name as well before. Hmm. Can't remember all of it. Now, I I L spy. Does that sound familiar? What? I L spy. I L spy. Yeah, I, I saw it in my uh, same folder. I can't remember. Um, There's too many things with the name spy appended to it. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this that's this looks like it does uh does give you a little deeper kind of look at the stuff. Yeah, apparently it does. So that one seems fairly interesting as well, but again, you need to actually Either have an idea what you want to use it for, yeah, absolutely, or or what you're looking to do. Oh my! There is a lot of information in there. Yeah. But that's resources. That's something else. So that's not really telling you much, is it? Yeah, I I don't know. I, I don't even yeah. know. What I should have picked a file. I knew what I was looking at um yeah you should probably go into the windows folder and find system uh whatever it's called 32 or it's on the system not system 32 i can't remember i think it's the system 32 folder if i remember right and then what's the name of the one you want uh can't remember them anymore. Win, no. win something? Win, mm. win 32, something like that? Is it? No, I don't remember them all. Okay. You can't remember all these thousands of files? No, it's too bad. <laughs> I should be able to do that. Uh, <laughs> I remember there being on the Dell call, he actually made names to them in the help file, where those are the ones that are usually loaded with Windows anyway. I thought there was like a s system. There doesn't seem to be. But there probably is. Well, let's just pick something. Yeah. And yeah. the file does not contain managed assembly. Yeah. So that really isn't telling you anything. Yeah. So the, who knows? The, the IL spy only is able to interpret managed assembly for you. Hmm. As you can see, that's at least what it's saying itself. So mm -hmm. again, it can only view specific formats of uh -huh. files. Okay. All right. Well. I wasn't sure what it was. I just got a bunch of these things. Apparently, yeah, at some point, 32, that's right. I, I looked at so this DLL viewer, IL spy. Yeah, I think the rest are actual DLL stuff that I had. Not they're not viewers. No. Yeah. People in chat are, are talking as well. So. Yeah. MSIL. <laughs> it seems that uh, more than a few have actually tried different programs to view Dell calls. Mm -hmm. but apparently, it's. Uh, I'm not saying that it's eluding everybody, but. Uh, yeah. Matrix's point there about most EXE, EXE files are just wrappers for DLLs anyway, right? I mean, they're, yeah, kind of putting it all together, right, and accessing. Um, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, did again. We we could do the same thing with a lot of Dell calls and call and and then end up just exiting everything at the end, and it would be the same. It it would simply be a wrapper for a lot of Dells within the Windows API. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
which other hot key mostly is uh, i'm not saying i i don't remember how much of it is directly tied to functions in the windows api but i think it's a good percentage of the actual code that's simply just calling native windows functions with a let's say a few or more attempts like uh, when you do win activate as an example mm -hmm. it tries to activate the window uh, a number of times five six times within a very short amount of time and i don't think the function natively does that i think that's built into our hotkey mm. but it's still calling a windows dell somewhere that's activating a window but the other hotkey command is just doing it a few times to try and make sure that the window is activated. I think that's that's where that's what we're getting by using other hotkey. These things that are extending the functionality of of what you would have access to normally, and that some of that comes from simply having users using a command. And if win activate doesn't actually activate the window when people use it, the noobs start saying so in the forums and now it's like to goes, but Chris once, once, once upon a time, he probably built a lot of extra functionality into all of these commands mm -hmm. just to try and make them even more noob friendly. Mm -hmm. This is just me dreaming up stuff. I don't know any <laughs> of that. Well, okay. that's often what a, a good rapper is doing, right? Is kind of simplifying yeah, of course all right yeah. hmm. Hmm. you're not really finding anything that help, that's helping us right again that's that's why it would be great to have someone who was used to doing this but uh, yeah I don't well, especially think so. and that was the one where where I alluded to that I get caught up in DLLs it's like when you start looking at the MSDN website of like okay here's a dll i want to use and then understanding like how you went through understanding the the uint or whatever it is what do you need to pass there and um yeah i get very confused in that but yeah but i i must say again with the message box the one that we did this time uh, it was fairly straightforward but sometimes when they call it something that it's it's not one of the usual ones that you see where they call it a double or whatnot or a long mm -hmm. or these where that's that's actually them trying to to help you closer to whatever it is but in our hotkey you actually need to know what a long is or a short or a double um, because you you can write that as the parameter you need to know if it's an integer or a string or a 64-bit version of the same thing or whatnot or if it's a pointer or if it's a buffer or if it's a structure and that's where the hard part comes in because e even I can't always mm -hmm. um, figure that out because yeah, I, I've never had any kind of learning about that. So it's only what I've been able to read. And because so few get very good at that level um, and still stay without a hotkey, mm -hmm. there's very little information about it. Because when, when people grasp that, they're often about to move away, move mm -hmm. on go to some other language or they're done in school or their education is over and they start actually working or what whatever they they do but for some reason people are dropping dropping off at about that level yeah. so we don't get too many right people able to help with that so Joe and Jack an idea for a, a future webinar then um, it's I, I've had a lot of success calling EXEs, and it looks like from what I learned today, calling DLLs probably won't be difficult. But uh, I had a situation a while back where somebody wanted me to work with. Um, actually, I think as I recollect, it was the IBM Watson capability, and they have 
an API, and it just raises the general question of when, when there's an, a formal API or SDK, um, and I think the Watson one, as I recollect, it had this whole page of languages that you could use, uh, Python and, uh, of course, all variants of C sharp, C, C, C plus, et cetera, but of course not auto hotkey, which was the one thing that I was hoping to be able to write it in. But um, so more generally speaking, if you guys could put together a, a webinar where you show how we can take an existing API or SDK that one would be calling in other languages and be able to call those in um, from auto hotkey code, that would be terrific. Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking. Yeah, yeah, you talk, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Um, because what what I especially when you mention Watson, what I'm not clear on if it's really, um, because the one thing I do a lot of is I do API calls to like web services, where I'm basically you know through the internet performing an HTTP protocol um, query to a server, and often you even submit you know um, parameters that'll that'll. Um, allow it to know it's an object and to do certain things in it and return, you know, structured data or whatever you want in a certain format. And I do that in a lot of different places. Um, there's a lot of stuff from Google that has some great services. There's like Mailgun I use for automating sending emails. There's Clearbit, which is what I'm using right now for doing calls to get data back on customers and contacts and their email addresses and companies. Um, LinkedIn for a long time has, they still have one, but it's not quite as um, open as it used to be. But Facebook, there's a lot of services out there where you can do an API call to it. Um, and now, so here's the thing is like, it's not, you don't find a language, you don't find a library in auto hotkey, but you can find it basically using com and the WinHTTP object to access it, to interact with it. So I, I, that'd be a good example if you could show how to do that. I, I, in fact, I, I posted a question on the auto hotkey forum, I don't know, probably a couple months ago. Didn't get a single response where what I was hoping to do, I, I'd written a program for a customer and, and it was all local stuff, manipulating stuff locally. And then she wanted to be able to send some some files that my program created on the client side up to an Azure website. And so, and there's apparently a way to transfer stuff up to Azure and I couldn't figure it out. And I posted something on a forum a couple of months ago and didn't get a single response. So, so your example of uh, whether it's HTTP calls or something else, it would be great to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, Azure is like the cloud for Microsoft? Is that right? That's correct. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and and they have a thing and they, so it's, it's part of the whole Microsoft cloud and one of the capabilities is called Azure storage. Mm -hmm. And so I was creating a whole bunch, you know, back to the thing I usually do with PDF files, I was creating a whole bunch of PDF files, having analyzed them and split, combine, all kinds of stuff. And now I'm sitting there with a whole bunch of files and she really wants them up on her website. Mm -hmm. And so in Azure storage, so mm -hmm. the question is, how do you get them up to Azure Storage? Now, if you Google it, you'll find Microsoft. There's a page on Microsoft, and it's got this whole section on how you get stuff up to Azure uh, from the client side. But I, I, I couldn't figure out the calls to make, and and once again, nobody, nobody on a on a forum responded to the. So, so I guess it's either tough to do or. Or nobody's figured it out yet. I don't know. Yeah, or well, no one has necessarily done it. Um, but but for me, because transferring files, did um, uh, digital is not the right word. What Jackie? What word am I looking for? They're not text files, right? But doing a binary transfer mm -hmm. um, is is different than doing API calls to web services that are passing back text back and forth, right? And and that was one where I. I was, I forget the example, but I was trying to do one where I was trying to transfer binary data. Um, and did it have something to do with the stream? Does that sound right at all? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, um, yeah. Um, I'd say to, to the end of Joe, I'm, I can't say for sure. I haven't seen your topic. I, I see most, but there is a few things that I don't have the time or, Others may not have the inclination to to work out, 
And one of the ones that I see still missing on the forum is the way to do some of these uh, authentications over the web. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OANC2 as, as an example. I've not seen anybody uh, make a, a working, I might, there might be one, but um, not many have actually succeeded. But uploading some files, and that depends on the API. Some APIs allow you to upload an entire file with a simple command, and others need you to do it in a stream, as we talked about, Joe. So, um, real quickly, I was going to chime in there too, because am I still sharing my screen? I think I am. Yeah, you're still sharing your screen. Yeah. So, I also, so at work, I will transfer files to our server that I didn't have to deploy. And I'm trying to look at the shortcut, but I use WinSCP, which is a free, here it goes. Um, it's a free program that'll do secure file transfers. And what's awesome was I was able to get this to work with auto hotkey from the command line. So I could basically, you know, pass everything, all the credit. I, I built the account in here storing my, you know, username and password. And then I wrote an auto hotkey script that would basically access this account and transfer the files without me having to open it or do anything. And maybe that's another approach where you kind of, you're not actually doing an API call to do it, but it still is getting the job done without that security stuff that Jackie was mentioning on depending on the service you're using and you got to do these handshakes and get back and forth and it can be complex. <laughs> okay, good guys. Thanks. Thanks for that. Well, hey, I'm going to drop off. Thanks for the, sem the webinar today and look looking forward to the next one. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to seeing you there as well. Hey, take care, guys, and um, sure. and thanks to Captain Odin for that, uh, that comment recently, and thanks to everyone else. Uh, see you guys later. No. Great stuff. Bye. Yep. Yeah, bye. Yeah, if, yeah. Does anybody have anything else? Yeah. And the other one, which I haven't seen, but is there a putty? I mean, I see so many resources using putty online that I'm surprised I don't see auto hotkey library for putty, but is there one that exists? Well, what, what uh, the, the question there is what, what are you looking for as working with putty? Just to transfer files. No, I don't think there is a library for it. Okay. Um, uh, I haven't used putty. I've, I've seen a lot of mentions about it. I think I saw Tank as having some stuff about it as well at one point. I think he's one of the the people who may have done most um, when it comes to that. But mm -hmm. he he hasn't really shared any any useful mm -hmm. stuff, I believe. Uh, but I've never searched for it, so there might might be something there. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. I think that Putty is just a remote desktop client. Does 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 that? Um, yeah, I correct. yeah yeah I just see a lot of when I'm reading documentation. You know, when I'm looking at 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 sources that say here's how you can transfer files to us. That's one of the things they often mention of like here's a putty example or a curl would be another one. A yeah, right. curl. I haven't seen the putty one, but curl, curl. That's a that's a command line utility mm -hmm. you can use to to uh, to send stuff. So that's probably a Dell. Uh, but but still, the putty one, I have never seen that, but it, yeah, I'm not saying it's not there. But the curl, I've seen that quite a lot. And that's all, that sounded like what Joe, uh, he, he did uh, quite often, was just call stuff using the command line and getting functionality that way. Mm -hmm. And that's see? what... Hmm? There's a comment in the forum from Mason Jar 13 um, about RDC and PuTTY may be used, but there were some better programs for file transfer. Yeah, I know that. As you can see, it's correct. It is an RDC. Yeah. Or is, that, is that what RDC is? Remote? Yeah, remote desktop or client. Client, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, PuTTY, I've, I've never used it, but I've heard about it. But yeah, absolutely, there are better programs to transfer files, that's for sure. Uh, but it is, just as with, with my current job, we have uh, 
one of Microsoft's products for remoting in. I can't even remember the name right now. Um, but again, it I don't think that there are actually APIs for those, are there? Yeah, the HTTP request with the binary file. Yeah, yeah um, but on that, because actually I was just going to bring that back up, but the, the thing with that is like it gets back into doing the handshake and dealing with the security stuff um, just adds another level to it. Of, of I mean, it can be done, right? It's just... It can it, be done. I, I know I've done a few of them, but I've never had to do it uh, for my own sake. Mm -hmm. I've never sat there and, and needed to do it for what I uh, I have at work myself and stuff. So I've never had the the time to use on it because to me it, it's a matter of using the needed time to figure it out and make a library or mm -hmm. an example that's that's interpreted or that's that's followable enough for other people to get something from it. Yep. And and I I believe that it's simply because no one has sat down and looked at these different ways that you need to authenticate yourself. I just saw, and actually I don't know how to. What, I'm I'm going to try to say his his name here, but the 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 reason for wanting to record from Mike. So there is, um, if you look, there's a a a um, comma object I believe for Dragon actually speaking as well, which yeah you yeah can yeah. To, um, instead of trying to record directly with that, but you could. Um, connect to the com object. I was playing with it some. Um, there's also, by the way, now Google, Google's, what is it, text-to-speech service has an API service that's available, but um, I hadn't finished doing it, but it, I was like, man, I could use, because their text, like on the phone, right, their text-to-speech is awesome, um, and I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. I could, I could use the Google's text-to-speech stuff to translate what I was saying. Um, Windows has a built-in version of text to speak as yep. well. Yep. Not not that is truly great on Windows Seven, but it might be better on eight or ten. Right. I don't know. Right. Yeah. I, I got to think that by now they're they're better. Yeah. No, I I know that that uh, SAP LPI is not as good as as some of the other ones, but still. Yeah. It's Especially there. for. You know, for like, I had one where I could highlight my email and just have it read it back to me if I was really lazy. Um, yeah. You know, you know, it was it was fun to play with. Yeah, that's the thing. But again, most of this stuff you you need to have um, a you need to have a use for whatever you're trying to do to actually use the time on making yeah. it work. That's that's one of the things I remember some years ago that I had this. What am I gonna write in out a hotkey? And and I couldn't really figure out where to go with with my extra free time, so I used most of it on helping people on the firm and solving their specific issues. And they were quite small, but it at least made me solve a lot of different issues. But to really go into some of the bigger ones. I think one of the things that are missing is the resources to really get help when it gets complicated. And and as we talked about earlier, we are kind of low on the people that truly know how to do yeah. this stuff. Yeah. We can do a lot of stuff, but the the things that are really advanced we don't have a lot of users able to do that. I have a few, but they are cramped as well. So, so you stopped sharing, or, or did it yeah, just I was, end itself? I, yeah, I just stopped sharing. Um, I was going to say if if I was going to stop recording too, just because um, we seem to be chat, which is fine, right? But I figured people who are going to be watching this later. Um, yeah, I, I think you're actually right. Let's let's cut it off, uh, Joe. As as I think it's 